Welcome to the land far away, where we discuss culture from a certain point of view. Some of my greatest passions are Star Wars and foreign languages. Strangely enough, these two topics will forever be connected in my brain. Suffice to say, when I saw Star Wars for the first time, it was dubbed in German, and at that point I didn't know any German at all. Ever since then I've been trying to watch the movies and read the expanded universe novels in as many languages as possible. In this video, or maybe a series of videos if time allows and you the viewers are interested, I wanted to share some of the things I've learned while doing so. For now I wanted to focus on world building and translation. If you're not interested in the theoretical side of things, please use the time code to jump to the next part of the video. Fantasy is commonly seen as the exact opposite of reality. Not only in strictly dictionary terms, but also in regard to film and literature. In eyes of people not well immersed in this genre, fantasy seems to be deprived of logic, or rules, and entirely separated from our reality. Because of that it famously requires suspension of disbelief from its viewers and readers to be fully appreciated. This point of view lacks the proper depth to appreciate all that the genre has to offer. It ignores the fact that well-crafted fantasy stories demand a tremendous effort to be put in world building. These unreal universes, born mostly from pure imagination, require development of their own history, geography, political system, mythology, language, and most importantly, a set of rules that are never to be violated. This, in fact, makes them incredibly fragile. A transgression of previously established canon may cause the illusion to break, which will lead the constructed world to collapse in the eyes of a viewer or reader. Thus a metaphorical agreement between the author and the consumer must be followed. World building can be approached in different ways, depending on the medium or purpose. Some creators start with a single core concept or idea and build the world around it, while others begin with a detailed map or history, and expand from there. World building often involves considerations such as the physical laws governing the world, the cultural norms and values of its inhabitants, the social and political structures, the economy, the technology available, and the overall atmosphere and mood. It requires careful thought and attention to ensure internal consistency and coherence within the constructed world. There are several dimensions of world building, including a purely linguistic one. There is a term in literary studies called an alonym. It refers to a newly coined word or name that possesses a world-building function, for example, Hobbit, Lightsaber, Jedi, Star Destroyer, Death Star. These words don't refer to anything we know from our own reality, but they are key in understanding the constructed worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien or George Lucas. Just imagine being a Lord of the Rings fan, trying to explain what a Hobbit is to someone who had never been exposed to any fantasy storytelling. It might take a while. And now imagine doing that in a foreign language. The art of translation is all about finding equivalents. But how do you translate words and names that don't have and cannot have equivalents in other languages, since they are made up? There is no single strategy. In fact, there's about 10 different ones, and every one involves different possible choices anyway. Tolkien, being a linguist, was aware of this challenge. That's why he actually wrote instructions for future translators of his work, but most authors aren't as meticulous. Apart from purely linguistic issues, there is also one connected rather to the business side of things. Consistency is one of the greatest tasks that awaits any translator. This is especially true when dealing with a long series of books, written by numerous authors, over an extended period of time, which have already been translated by various translators. A good practice in such scenarios is to create a common glossary, which would include proper names, newly coined words, catchphrases, and idioms used in the series, that must be translated consistently. To give an example, otherwise the well-known phrase, may the force be with you, will sound slightly differently each and every time, depending on who's translating it. In some cases, such glossary is a result of an agreement of cooperating translators. Alternatively, it is developed with time, through evolution, as some variants gain popularity among readers, and are canonized by them, while others do not. Still, there are many instances all over the world when the same novel exists in completely different translations, published by competing publishing houses, and as a result readers are left with varying vocabularies. Let's take a look at such examples in three languages that I'm familiar with, 
German, Polish, and Russian. A lightsaber is one of the symbols of the Star Wars franchise. It is the weapon of the Jedi. Visually it's striking, but linguistically, like many alonyms of Star Wars, lightsaber is rather simple. It's just a combination of two words, but it does get the image through, it's a saber with a blade of light. You would think it shouldn't be difficult to agree on one translation in every language. Let's see, starting with German. I looked through 36 Star Wars novels published in German between 1978 and 2000, and translated by 15 different translators. I was able to find only one variant, Das Lichtschwer. Adjective Licht means light in German, while Das Schwer means sword. So you could say Germans undisputedly call the Jedi's weapon a light sword. Props to the translators that they were able to agree upon one variant from the very start. Now let's move east. Nowadays all Polish Star Wars fans refer to a lightsaber as Miecz Svetny. Miecz means sword, while Svetny is an adjective meaning light. So we once again end up with a light sword. However, if you were to look through almost 130 Star Wars novels, which were published in Polish between 1991 and 2010, like I did, you will find some variety, at least in the earliest books. For example, the Empire Strikes Back novelization features a variant, Miech Laserovi, so a laser sword. Meanwhile, in Splinter of the Mind's Eye you will find, Svetli Sti Miech. Svetli Sti, is a more artsy form of, Svetni, so it's basically still a laser sword, but just slightly different. So far nothing crazy, but let's move even further east, this time to Russia. Oh my! There are so many options to pick from over there. First of all, Luch Sablier. Luch means beam or ray, while Sablier is saber. So a back translation would be beam like saber. If you don't fancy sabers and would prefer to stick to swords, Russians got you covered. You can pick from Luchevoy Miech, beam like sword, Laseni Miech, laser sword. Svietovoy Miech, Light Sword, and even Ogneni Miech, Fire Sword. The latter was used in several books published by Asbuka Publishing House. On one occasion, I also saw someone call a lightsaber, Lasenaya Rapira, Laser Rapier, but that was in a review, not in a book. The core of Star Wars is not only Jedi and lightsabers, but also dogfights in space. If you ask me, one of the coolest looking ships is TIE Fighter. When you think about it, it can cause more trouble to translators than to X-Wing pilots, because of its name. TIE is an English acronym. In law, it stands for Twin Ion Engine, but as far as I know, this was a later addition to the canon. Initially, in the development stage, these fighters were probably named after a bow tie, because they kinda look like them. Just like X-Wings looked like the letter X. Anyway, what do you do when you want to translate a fictional name, which is an acronym, that you can't decode? There are several possible approaches to this puzzle. Let's see what did German, Polish and Russian translators do. Germans left Thai as it is, and just replaced the word fighter with its German equivalent, Jäger. So in Germany the standard imperial fighter is called Thai Jäger. I looked through my collection, books old and new, and I didn't find any other variant. Once again, this speaks to the high quality of German translators who found the best option right away, and consequently stuck with it. Meanwhile Polish translators did more or less the same. The predominant variant is Mischliwetz Thai. Mischliwetz, meaning a fighter plane, so it's literally Thai fighter. Sometimes translators would also call them Mischliwetz Tipu Thai, so a Thai type fighter, but it's more or less the same. It doesn't sound as slick as the previous version, but it makes more sense. It gives the reader some indication what tie is, a brand, or a model. However, if you go back far enough, to the earliest Star Wars novels published in Poland, you will also find such variants as TIE Fighter, so a purely English one, and T Mischliwetz, so T Fighter. The latter one doesn't make sense, since this ship doesn't resemble the letter T, but come on, B-Wing doesn't look much like a B either. 
Now let's check with Russians. There are three predominant variants, one lazy and two pretty creative. The lazy one is, Eastry Beetel, which is the Russian word for a fighter plane. They completely dropped the tie part, and that's it. On the other hand, in some novels you will find a variant, Sid Eastry Beetel. Sid stands for Zidvoni, Yoni, D. Vigatil, Double Ion Engine. Now that's full translation. Examples of applying the same approach but clumsily can be found in novels released by Exmo Publishing House. Their variant is, D.E. Eastry Beetel. D.E. stands for D. Voinoi, Yoni. Double Ion. Double Ion what? Where's the noun? Or is it supposed to be Double Ion Fighter? This doesn't make much sense. Speaking of not making sense, I left the best for last. In the earliest translations, you will see variant, Taiski Eastry Beetel. Thai Fighter. Thai, as in one hailing from Thailand. Of course, that's just a stupid mistake, but what a precious one. Let's finish this video with a proper name of a spaceship, Millennium Falcon. Now this is quite a pickle. One could argue that the word Falcon is too earthbound, as it implies the existence of these majestic birds in the galaxy far, far away. Still, as long as a language has a word for a falcon, translation shouldn't be difficult. However, I never understood what the millennium part refers to. Was it simply supposed to sound futuristic? Is it a play on the Maltese Falcon? If you know the answer, please leave it in the comment section. You can't translate an alonym if you don't understand it, so you can imagine how tricky this one could be. Let's go through the list for the last time. As usually, German translators did a fine job. They nailed it right away with their Millennium Falke. Polish translators hesitated a bit. First of all, there are two Polish words for Millennium. The purely Latin one, Millennium, and its literal Slavic translation, Tysinch let year. However, for Polish years the former sounds posh, so it wasn't the obvious choice, despite being closer to the English original. Secondly, as we will see, translators struggled with what the Millennium part is supposed to mean when combined with Falcon. In the end, they came up with these variants. The most popular one, Sokol Millennium. Sokol means Falcon in Polish. Both of these words are nouns, so if Sokol comes before Millennium, a relationship of possession is implied, as in, Falcon of the Millennium. It's short, vague, and sweet. I've always preferred this version. But there are two other ones as well. Firstly, Sokol Tysinch Lechia. This one could be translated back to English as Falcon of the Millennium once again, but here we have the Slavic word instead. Secondly, Tysinch Letni Sokol. This version is just awful. Tisinch let she means, millennium, while Tisinch letni means, thousand year old. I know this ship is old, but it's not thousand years old. So, there are three versions in Poland. One hit, one semi-hit and one miss. Now let's check on Russians. As fellow Slavs, Russian translators came across same problems as the Polish ones. They also hesitated between, Sokol Tisayat She Le Tia, Falcon of the Millennium, and Tishach Letni Sokol, Thousand Year Old Falcon. Both versions are still widely used. Some early translations would lazily drop the Millennium part and call the ship Sokol. I know in English, characters do refer to it simply as Falcon, but not all the time. However, if you dig deep and find a 1993 translation of the Return of the Jedi novelization, there you will read that Han Solo's ship is called Tisait She Letan Ya Yar Olitsa, the thousand-year-old she-eagle. I have absolutely no idea why would someone swap the kind of bird, and also its sex. I know in English ships are referred to as she, but not in Russian, where ship, korabel, is a masculine noun. That's so wonderfully absurd you just can't help but love it. It's like that one Russian translation that literally features Luke Mibokod as the main hero. Yes. Nebohard is the literal translation of Skywalker, and no, no one calls him that in Russia. But that's a story for another time. Thanks for sticking till the end of this video.
Let me know if you would like to learn more about Star Wars in other countries and languages. Maybe you speak languages that weren't mentioned here and you could share your knowledge with us. I hear French translators also had some interesting ideas. Anyway, please like this video, share, subscribe, and until next time, bye.